Hello. So uh, I'm going to talk about where I see our replication, the Postgres replication scenario being today and where I think it should go and where we know it's going and just how those play together. So just to understand where that we start from a common point of view is what is actually replication? Replication is moving the content from one system to another in the most generic sense, having similar data or the same data on several systems. And then the interesting part here is what we have right now built in in Postgres is the so-called physical replication, and that works on a block level basis pretty much. It works by saying, okay, we have this data on disk pretty much, and then we move that on the other side. That is very good, it's very efficient, has some disadvantages though. So there's a reason why other people build logical replication solutions and those just work on a content level. So if you insert the data, they, what it creates is usually say, okay, an insert happened and that is the content. And so, and I think the other answer here, you probably help what, uh, know what Postgres is by now. So, uh, Postgres started, when it started, it didn't have any replication solution built in. And then uh, Jan, I don't know if he's in here, uh, amongst others, created Sloney, and that's a replication, logical replication solution. Uh, it works by creating triggers, so every time you modify a row, it creates a trigger, uh, creates a row in another queue table, and that queue table then gets read by another database, and then the change gets reapplied. That works quite well, and I think Without having Sloney, Postgres would not be here where we are today. I think nobody of us would be here because we couldn't afford conference, uh, having a conference in the Soto. So um, it's also the case that both Sloney and Lindista still allow you to do things that no of the, not, none of the solutions allow you to do. So it's still, they are still important. They also so show that they have some problems which is why Postgres in version 9.0 added stream replication. And I think, it, again, in the case, we, if we didn't have stream replication, none of us would be here. Because that was, I think, one of the linchpin moments of Postgres development and Postgres uh, popularity. And stream replication is much, much simpler to set up and maintain than Sloney and Londiste. It's also much more efficient, but it has much, much less flexibility. You can't ever create a temporary table on the standby. You can't ever have different indexes on the standby. None of that is possible, ever. You always have to replicate all databases in a cluster. So it definitely has some limitations. So what we also got in the last couple of years, because I and others worked on it, is we have in Postgres the infrastructure to build a better replication solution or a more modern mod replication solution. What we introduced in 9.4 is uh, logical decoding. What that allows is to uh, get all the changes that happen in a database in a configurable format, format and do something with that. One of these applications is doing replications, other is doing feeding it into different systems, uh, doing cache invalidations, there's many use cases, but that's what we added it. Some other products call that change data capture. So, and we also built a lot of other infrastructure. One of them, uh, which I think was a very important step, even if it wasn't actually that complicated, is so-called background workers. We now have the ability inside one database to start additional tasks that do something. For example, we receive changes by another system. That's why we added it, but there's many other use cases. So why do we think we need anything but what we have today? We, the trigger-based solutions we, for which Sloney and Lindiste are an example have a, their fair share of problems. Most importantly, they have a very high overhead, both in runtime, every time you do an insert, it calls a trigger, the trigger then inserts that row into a queue table, and that has a certain CPU overhead. It also prevents some optimizations, for example, normally if you insert data with copy, it can use bulk modes, all that doesn't work anymore if you ever have triggers. So trigger, they have a runtime overhead. They also have a space overhead because every insert that goes into uh, the actual table also has to be inserted into the queue table so it then can be replicated. That means they have a write amplification of, of about two, in many cases even worse. So uh, that has a 
quite the high price. The other problem is that due to issues which about ordering and so on, you can never do synchronous replications with the established uh, 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 trigger-based replication solutions because they figure out in which order to replicate data by doing the, the replication like in bigger blocks than one transaction. And that prohibits you from doing synchronous replication on a one transaction basis. That's also the problem that the current solutions can't uh, replicate DDL because uh, there's no way to just get notified about, oh, the schema is changing. And in my experience, that's one of the most frequent issues for systems breaking down because suddenly somebody added a unique key on one side but forgot it on the other side, then they fail over and suddenly they have data corruption. Stuff like that, I've seen that so many times now. Um, they are also in not very really easy to administer. I've, and that's one of the bigger problems. I've seen so many downtimes caused by somebody not actually understanding how slowly learn this to work. It's also very hard to do multi-master because if you insert into one system, it will then insert the row into the queue table, it will be replicated on the other side, and the other side will then again try to uh, insert the, that row into the queue table and then it will go back and forth. Then you build loops. There's a way to prevent that by having columns in there that say, oh, this is a row that I've been replicating. But that gets quick, ugly quickly, and you suddenly, every user sees additional columns, so it's not that easy. Another problem is that it's not built in. And I think many customers or many users there say, go to the Postgres website and say, oh, I want to do replication, and they see the built-in physical replication, say, hmm, that's okay, I can live with that, and then they discover, oh, they can't all do all these nice things, they have to replicate everything, and then they get unhappy. And then they go to some fancy new NoSQL or whatever thing. The other problem with physical replication, the big problem is that you can't ever do uh, selective replication. You can't ever say, I only want to replicate my configuration data, but all the other data is sharded and I'm only needing it on two systems for availability, but everything else, please don't replicate everywhere. It's not possible to do that with physical replication. Also, you can't ever create a, a temporary table, you can't have non-replicated tables on the standbys, and that's quite a big problem. So physical replication is great for HA, but after that, it starts to be less useful. So what we worked on based on these features that I mentioned earlier, logical decoding, background workers, and some smaller ones, is that we uh, built logical replication solutions using those tools. And yesterday, we released the version 0 0.9. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't yet managed to send out the release announcement. It's a bit complicated, but yeah. So, and that works with stock 9.4. You can use this extension and replicate data from one system to another in one direction. That's what unidirectional means. UDR, unidirectional replication. Um, so you can replace uh, things like um, stream replication, Sloney, Londista with that and it will have much less overhead. How much less, I'll come to in a second. And what it can do is uh, uh, do initialization in parallel already, or what I think is already a great, great feature, it can initialize from a physical base backup. You can safely say, I'm doing a PG base backup, and then catch up all the changes that happened since you made the base backup, and not miss a single transaction. And that is very good if you ever want to upgrade from, say, 9.4 to 9.5, doing it via a, a logical dump of the database and then catching up all the data since that takes a long, long while because on a large database running PG dump is not exactly fast. So I think initialization of uh, logical replication via base backup is a very good facility. What we also have is partial replication. You can say, I don't want to replicate data that's done to some table, uh, to that table, because it's the log table and I only want that locally, because it's too volume, has too high volume. But what we don't do, unfortunately, in 0 0.9 is to, if you, even if you say, I don't replicate changes to those tables, it will still initially, when you clone, when you create the clone, it will still copy the tables. So we we'll have to add more, some more work there to not uh, do that. 
it's also what it also doesn't handle if you say you can change which data is replicated but it will not if it's say initially I'm not replicating the log table but then discover oh logging is really nice and I want to also replicate it because suddenly my log analysis tool wants to look at it or whatever uh, then we don't have a facility to automatically say reclone all the old data you can start replicating it but not more and as I said it allows to upgrade relatively seamlessly from one version to another with like a couple, like a second or three of downtime where you redirect the writes to the standby. And that's, I think, how we are going to do much e uh, more seamless upgrades to ma new major versions. Obviously, that doesn't help you very, very much right now because this only works with 9.4 and there's no 9.5 yet. So upgrading from 9.4 to anything is not that interesting yet. It's also now fully configurable via SQL. And I think that's a big step. We used the first version of both BDR and UDR were configurable via PostgreSQL.conf and it confused very many people. It required restarts to reconfigure it and it was obviously not good enough. It was also much simpler, but yeah. So how can you configure it now? You need to change a couple of things in PostgreSQL.conf. They are pretty much independent of which replication, logical replication solution you use, but you have to change those once. Unfortunately, those all require a restart. But once you've changed those, you could have 10 replicas for this database. And uh, you need to allow the replica access via pghba.conf, but that's pretty normal because, yeah. And after that, you only need to do create extension BDR and on, this, on both nodes, and then you say select BDR.BDR subscribe, tell it uh, how is my node called, and to which node am I connecting to? And that's also important, how am I connecting to myself? Because unfortunately, Postgres doesn't have the ability to grant connection authorization tokens or something that allows you, I'm allowing you to connect to me with my authentication. That would be very nice, but we don't have it today. And that will automatically clone all the data and do that in the background. And if you want to do it in the foreground, you can say, okay, I'm waiting to, uh, till it's done. And you'll notice that it he says here BDR, and that's because we only wanted to create one uh, extension of one, two, BDR and UDR. But if you say BDR subscribe, it only subscribes changes, that will only work in one direction. So it will pull all the changes from the other side, but it will not push back any other changes. If you want to uh, do it in both directions, I'll come to that later. So, and why did we actually do this? as a very uh, brief introduction. So with using hot standby, and we can at, with pgbench on a moderately good uh, uh, EC2 instance, we can push 14,000 TPS, write TPS per second. With UDR, it's very, very, very slightly slower, but there's barely any difference because the write overhead for uh, pgbench wor type workloads is minimal. There's ba barely any overhead. With BDR, it's pretty much the same. I think the difference here is mostly runtime variation. And then we also compare that with Londist. And you can see the overhead here already is pretty, pretty big. If you go to, more, uh, to systems that have more complex writes that write to more tables in one transaction, that difference gets even bigger. We have had a comparison where it was a factor of uh, three or so difference. Sloney is very slightly slower here, but I think that's not really measurable. So that's just what you get, have to pay for using a trigger-based replication solution. So what we next did, we have a simulation where uh, we didn't just use replication, but we also wanted to, to measure how expensive is it to then pull out these changes and apply them on the other side. It's very nice if you can produce changes as fast as you can, but the re replication can't ca ca catch up the, a replica that's three days old isn't very interesting. So what we did, we said, every time there's a lag of more than two seconds, we throttle the workload to see how, how long can we keep up. And with hot standby, we could, uh, in that slightly different workload, we had a, to write a custom tooling because PGBench can't do that. Uh, we could do 25 something uh, TPS. With UDR, it was slightly less. Uh, with BDR, slightly more than UDR, there's actually a technical reason for that. I'll come to that in a second. And if you do see the really crazy comparisons then with Londist and Sloney. 
the overhead of pulling the data out of the log and then applying them in transforming the format and applying them on the other side is quite tremendous. And that shows here as well. Um, we, what we measured here is for the PG bench workload, how much write ahead lock are we producing? So for uh, 10,000 transactions, we, uh, how much many megabytes of write ahead lock are we producing? This is a bit badly labeled. Uh, the primary here is with hot standby off, and the standby is with hot standby on. That's, we should probably label that differently, but whatever. So uh, that's about how much write ahead lock we are creating. With UDR, on the primary, we are pretty much the same as hot standby. There, there are workloads where uh, UDR will have a noticeably higher overhead than, uh, or, or BDR than hot standby, but PG Bench doesn't trigger those. But you notice that the standby uh, has, produces quite a bit more write ahead lock. And that's because we, have, we are missing one feature which, uh, that we are proposing for Postgres 9.5 that allows you to safely say, we have replicated up to here and I'm not going to lose any transactions. And that's required because UDR and BDR work on a per transaction basis to support things like uh, synchronous commit as uh, synchronous replication. So you can't batch transactions sanely. Uh, and that's the overhead of doing that, saving the replication progress in a table. So in BDR, we don't have that problem because we have uh, the feature there. And that's, uh, there's somewhat more overhead on the, stand on the other side, but it's pretty good if you compare it with uh, the other side. And then you go to the trigger-based uh, replication solutions. And you see, they slightly, write slightly, slightly more. We also had uh, Bucardo here at some point in somewhere here or so. So I think that is evidence why, from an efficiency point of view, we, you, we really want something else than trigger-based replication solutions. And why hot standby is very, very, and stream replication is very good for some cases. They do it in a much more coarse fashion. They don't apply it individual transactions. And if you don't do it on a per transaction basis, the overhead is obviously lower, but then you can't do sync wrap pretty much fundamentally. So that's the reasoning here. Um, so that's what we can do with 9.4. Uh, with what we release now, you can pull it from uh, git.postgresql.org, I'll link it later. There's now official release docs. We don't rely on the wiki anymore. It uses the Postgres documentation format, so it will look familiarly uh, old style. <laughs> yeah. So, and, but also the announcement for this talk said we were talking about Multimaster because what we, that's what, where we, how we got started how this, how, down this whole path. What we have now is with BDR, we have a working asynchronous multimaster solution. And I'll mention that it's in production today. There are still sometimes problems, but it generally seems to work reasonably well. Um, it basically uses all the code that is used for UDR that works with 9.4 and then adds additional capabilities. Because with unidirectional replication, obviously that's not multimaster, so we added to add more feature. And one of the features that I think is the most coolest is if you execute on one side DDL, it will automatically replicate to the other side. There's some caveats that I'll mention in a second. <laughs> but yeah, it's, we had customers that said, please, can you somehow magically transport this to 9.4? Because we really, really want this. And uh, I think it's too much work. So we said no. <laughs> um, what you also did, uh, besides uh, just the uh, asynchronous replication, uh, multi-master replication, is to allow uh, sequences to work across multiple systems because it's, there's various ways to assign unique IDs across systems. You can use UIDs. You can say that you can assign every odd values on this system and every even values on this system, but it gets relatively hairy and it's not very user friendly. So it, what we added is when you say create sequence, you can now say create sequence using BDR and then it uses a voting approach that says this server gets the values from 0 to 1,000. This server gets the values from 1,000 to 1 to 2,000 and so on. 
and there's some caching to avoid short downtimes uh, to cause problems and similar things. What you also added is conflict resolution mechanisms because if you do asynchronous multi-master across, that is, you can have conflicts because two systems can do the same change. So we, what we have by default is uh, last update wins, but you can add different conflict resolution strategies by saying, uh, calling a function set that registers a conflict handler. And that conflict handler then gets both sides of that change and can decide what we want, what we want to do with that. So, and why did we actually go to all that trouble? This is several person years of work here. Um, it's very hard to do geographically distributed setups where, um, without replicating data to the other sides because latencies of 150 or so milliseconds are really, really painful to work with. It, everything crawls, slows down to a crawl. So, and those are becoming more and more common. So I think that's the prime reason to do asynchronous multi-master because with synchronous multi-master you have latency problems without, without replication. You have also latency problems because you all, every write, write has to go to the other side. So they're pretty much, if you want to have shared state, there's relatively little choice to, than to go there. It's also very useful to scale read mostly uh, applications without saying I'm separating read and writes. If your application doesn't write that much data and you can somehow ensure that the writes aren't conflicting very often, that can give you quite easy scalability boosts, even if you're not geographically distributed, if you're in the same data center. It's also very useful to uh, do very easy failover failback. I don't know who of you has implemented uh, procedures for uh, failing over of a hot standby node, then bringing up the old master as a new standby. That's not all that simple. So it can be very much easier to say, I'm just redirecting all the writes to the other side, waiting for catch up, and then say, okay, I have, have finished fa falling over. What we also have customers wanting very much is that they want to have some shared state between clusters of data, uh, but where they, like the configuration data is in there. The, U, the authentication info is there, but all the rest of the data is sharded. So they want to not have the chat messages or whatever on all nodes, but they want to have to know, can I send a message to that user, just that user exists. They want that information on all nodes. And that's, in my opinion, quite large use case for a wider uh, range of applications. So what can these setups look like? What you can have is um, have, say, a one data center or two data centers in Europe. They uh, are fully interconnected between those two, and you can say, my data is important. I want to do synchronous replication between these European data centers. They are in the same city, just date different data centers. To not avoid, to avoid losing data, I want to have my important transactions to be replicated synchronously but you can't do that across the pond because that's just too slow. So you have two another uh, database servers, uh, data centers in uh, North America, for example, and they do the same spiel. They replicate synchronously between them, and, but other, to the other side of the pond, they do asynchronous replication. As you can see here, to set up BDR currently, you have to, every node has to connect with each other, and that's because otherwise it's much more complicated. If one node goes down, you have to reroute traffic around that. It's just simpler to implement that way. There's no fundamental assumption that we are always are only going to do this. It's just what we have chosen as the first step. So to go back to what I uh, was saying about transparency to other application, normally you can just say, I'm now executing DDL. I type my create table, whatever, and it creates the table, replicates it to the other side, and executes the DDL again. That works great for create, but there's some commands we can't replicate at all, because um, commands like create database, alter user, or create user, and similar, in Postgres, they're shared between different databases in one cluster. So, and since BDR and generally logical replication usually works on a per database level, it's unclear what does it mean that in a different database you execute a create user. 
you would have to know that in some other database in that server there's a logical replication co uh, configured and you would somehow need to replicate it then. So that's why these commands are not replicated. There's also some commands that we currently prohibit from actually being executed. You will just get an error, which is not so nice, but yeah, better than corrupt data. Um, you can't at the moment change all the type of columns when you specify using a clause or if you uh, have generally, if the alter table requires a table rewrite, we don't allow it. There's also a good reason why you don't ever want to execute these in your actual application because those will cause a table rewrite and that takes a long, long time. The, all the commands that just add a column without any rewrites, that, those are completely fine or dropping a column, that all works. Just everything that's slow is not allowed. Uh, if you grant and revoke, that's actually allowed as long as it's doing it to a local table. So you can say grant t select on table and that works. What you're not allowed to do or what's not replicated is grant connect on database because again, global state. So when is asynchronous multimaster and specifically BDR a good solution? If you only have, if you have data where, it's, for example, every user is only allowed from, to connect from their home country or is automatically redirected, then you can't ever have conflicts and then the, it's pretty easy to cope with the uh, possibility that you have uh, data that's not completely in sync. The other thing is that you just write your application and you're aware that there can be inconsistencies for a while. Um, other workloads where you just can't have conflicts, if you have only inserts and you don't have any uh, unique constraints that will fail, then it's just very easy to implement this. And just generally, if you are ge geographically distributed, especially over long distances, this asynchronous multimaster might be a good uh, fit. What you, when you don't want to use it is if you have something where consistency is really, really important, it can never ever be violated because you're dealing with whatever, medical data for example, and you don't want to lose a patient record because there was a conflict and somebody said, oh, this patient is ill and somebody otherwise accidentally overwrote that with this patient is actually a healthy, please send him home, that would not be good. So last update wins might not be the best idea for two, to resolve conflicts by two doctors making to the same patient. Um, it's also much harder to validate that all your applications are doing something correct. If uh, you have 10 applications written by 10 development teams, three of them don't even exist, two of them are di have died since, then it's very hard to guarantee that you can actually cope with the co uh, possibility of conflicts. It's also very, very important to note that asynchronous multimaster does not guarantee unlimited write scalability to forever. You can have some benefits by uh, doing, you gain, can gain some write scalability, but it's usually not super drastic and it very, very quickly tapers off. So as I said, con for conflict handling, we have the built-in uh, last update wins. We use the transaction timestamp when it committed as to resolve that by default, and you can add newer uh, conflict handlers. It's not that interesting, I think, unless you really started to look into it. So it's a bit complicated how all these fit together. At the moment, we have Postgres, and that has built in logical decoding, it has built in background workers, and in 9.5, we already added some more features. And then on top of that, there's the UDR project. That's open source, you can download it, you can, there's Debian packages, there's RPM packages for uh, Fedora, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, I think. And those, that you builds logical replication, but only unidirectional. It allows you to upgrade in, in the near future to new versions with a very short downtime, and it supports 9.4, which is important. Then on top of that, we have a slightly modified version of Postgres. And we modified that because we needed the additional capabilities. We have uh, a couple features in there where we had to modify things like, for example, the DDL replication required us to get the DDL statement back in some form that we can replicate. We have the ability to create these new types of sequences where we can say this sequence is a distributed sequence. We have the uh, commit timestamps with which since have been committed to 9.05, but if you want to use 9.04 because you don't want the most bleeding edge in product, uh, version in production, 
we have that as a modification uh, and then we have this re replication origin progress tracking which is why you saw in UDR earlier that it wrote more than the primary uh, than BDR did and using these modifications we have a version of the extension that's the same source code as the UDR that uses these additional capabilities to implement multi-master to implement these distributed sequences to implement DDL replications and I want to emphasize that all of these features with the except with, except this one, have been submitted uh, to the PostgreSQL mailing list. We've worked on several of them th through many iterations, trying to make them committable. And uh, so it's not like these modifications are something secret we are, that we are keeping. It's just we're trying to develop all this, and it takes a long, long time. And Postgres takes a long, it has a year-long re release cycle. But if you develop something new, it takes a while, a year-long release cycle is not very attractive because the feedback, you want to get it out to your users. You want feedback from users. You want to have product tests where you can actually use this in a realistic scenario because then you know you screwed up and what your user interface didn't work out that great. For example, we had this configuration format where it was in postgresql.conf and that really didn't work out great in the customers where we tried it. It was confusing. So we had to try something else, which we now do. And I think for these iteration, for these relatively early development where it's very useful to have something that, that develops fa faster than Postgres. It's, it's very good that Postgres doesn't release every week. I think you all would be not very happy about <laughs> this. So there's good reasons for Postgres developing the way it does, but it also has some problems because it takes a long while to get things in. Yeah, that was what I was saying. Um, so, and the, what, we are, what Simon came up with uh, as a phrase, we're not forking Postgres with the BDR special sauce. <laughs> but it, <laughs> BDR, that really, really follows Postgres pretty closely. We are submitting everything upstream. We hope that this difference really, really vanishes soon. <laughs> <laughs> Are you alive uh, down there? <laughs> it's also very important that we are, every time Postgres is going to release a point release, we are also going to have a point release, and we are pretty much merging the changes that are happening upstream pretty frequently. Um, so where are we now with regards to core Postgres? We have lots of infrastructure. We have logical decoding in core. We have background workers in core. We have now commits timestamps in core. We have a relatively, except some conflicts here with Robert uh, and Heike, <laughs> have a relatively sane uh, version of the replication progress uh, patch. It even has docs. We have uh, sequence AM, and Heike was actually somewhat happy with the last version, which is nice. Um, we have the ability to develop these event triggers that do give you this sane version of the DDL that you then can replicate. And this is not specific to Postgres at, at all. You can also integrate that into other replication solutions. You can integrate it into your development workload. You can automatically generate uh, the, the evolve script for whatever ver uh, database schema tracking you want and for auditing and similar. Those have all been submitted. We hope to get them committed relatively soon. The only one we didn't, uh, didn't, we didn't manage to get very far is the val-based queuing solution. That's just because it depends on the replication identifiers. So it was, there was not that much to do uh, before that was in. But, 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 the big problem is we have, don't have a built-in logical replication solution. It's very hard to sell to people that you have to go to some website, you have to install this, you have to install a different repository, then you have to download it, then you have to read different documentation. It's very complicated. And that, if you have already a big Postgres shop, you're pro probably willing to do this. But if you are new to this and are choosing which database you are going to use, it's not going to in inspire that very much confidence that you have to go to uh, some random other website and download another project. So. That's really not enough. 
we need to have something that integrates much, much more seamlessly. Um, but you might think, why on earth did you develop something separately if you want to commit it to Postgres? And uh, I, the reason for that is really that it's very hard to develop stuff in Postgres. Postgres has very high quality standards. It has a very uh, debate, enthusiastic community. And <laughs> <laughs> that's good most of the time. It d but it makes it very hard to prototype a solution where you know, I'm going to make compromises because I can't develop the best solution on Earth within a couple months. So I think it's very important to allow for some of that stuff to happen outside. And you might ask, yeah, sure, you can do it outside. You can just work on your patch for three years. But uh, A, users don't really like not to have this capability. They're happier to have something outside of core that works. Um, also, we actually need to get paid for developing this. And our users that pay us for this are not very happy to wait several years. Or they actually have waited a couple of years, but even more years. It's also very hard to have something that actually is nice if you don't have users testing the development version. So um, where can we, where do I think we go for the in-core logical replication? How can we make this happen? I think we have to accept that we are not going to integrate BDR as is into Postgres. For A, there's lots of compromise in there that post core Postgres might not accept. It's also just a honking lot of complexity that you can't just absorb immediately. So we're going to try to Im uh, add the unidirectional replication first, and, but design it in a way that we, based on our experience, can then extend to multi-master. And how long that takes, we'll see. I think it's also important to note that we realize that it won't exactly look like UDR. For UDR, we had very different constraints uh, than core Postgres has. We couldn't just say, oh, we want this new uh, statement in Postgres. We, we, didn't want, we couldn't say, we have a new create replica command or create primary server whatever command because we, can't, we didn't want to modify Postgres. So that might be different for the integrated version, but I think we can reuse some of the code and very, very much some of the experience and some of the infrastructure we built to get there. For example, the logical decoding API hopefully doesn't need any changes. The commit timestamps won't, won't need any changes. The background worker API won't need any changes, and so on. Um, and while we are working on integrating this, we are also working on, will continue to provide UDR and BDR because I think Postgres can't really survive at the moment. We have customers that need it and I think we, those aren't the only ones. So I think that's just saying. And we'll try to maintain those, but at some point, for example, we are not going to need UDR anymore. So we are going to retire it, but we'll still need BDR for a while. But at some point, I hope, we come to the point where we say, okay, now it's so, so major, the, this stuff that is uh, in core Postgres, we don't need an external version anymore. Those features aren't that urgent anymore that you need uh, a pre-cooked version for immediate use. But until then, we are going to maintain those. And we are also going to work on new features in BDR and UDR uh, just for, to extend Postgres later with them and to get experience with them and also to just make a life for users of Postgres easier. And here are the features that we're at the moment thinking about working on or are already working on. One of the big ones is I think partial clones that you can clone a database and it will only have the tables that you want the replication, the want to replicate changes to. We need to make a uh, failover to the other side a bit easier. There's quite a bit of manual work involved there. Most importantly, we don't, you need to have one manual actions af action afterwards to bring up the sequences to the highest than uh, value. That's not so nice, so I think we need to make that easier. Probably not too hard. Um, the, the way you mon mo uh, configure replication sets, which is our solution to saying only these changes are needed. On the other note, I think we need some more improvement. If you configure 
if the, for example, right now, if you say, I want this node replicates all the changes from the other node, and you change that configuration, we are going to automatically need to pull down all the missing tables, delete all the other tables, and uh, also you don't, shouldn't need to kill, have to kill some node or restart to do that. Yeah, that's actually already there. Um, for also what we want to do as soon as possible is to move the f ability to DDL replication from BDR into UDR. So because there's no re the, nothing multi-master specific about uh, doing DDL replication. Right now, if you want to uh, do DDL, it will tell you, you can't do that. Please use, use this function and then you have a function that does the DDL and replicates it. That, or you can say, I know what I'm doing, let me do this. Um, for BDR, uh, we want to lift some of these restrictions. I was saying earlier that you can change the type of a column if that requires a table rewrite. We want to allow that. Um, right now, you can't do create table as whatever. We want to allow that, so stuff like that. What also we want to do, and I think that's I personally find that a pretty cool feature. We want to have transactions where you say, this is a really, really important transaction. I can't allow uh, any conflicts here. And then we can guarantee by using 2PC internally, this transaction is going to be replicated correctly to all nodes, and I'm only going to return a successful commit if it actually worked. And I think that allows you to design systems where the relatively low amount of actually important writes always succeeds, but the rest is fast. Because obviously, using these conflict-free transactions will, will far, be far from free. They will have to contact all the other nodes synchronously, so you surely don't want to use that for everything. We also want to make distributed sequences a bit easier to use. Right now, you can configure how many of them are pre-allocated and things like that. Also, if you will get an error instead of blocking if there are no new values at the moment available and just some usability enhancement. So um, a rather important question is where can you get this stuff? It's on bdrproject.org. The docs are under bdrproject.org slash docs and there you can see the different versions. And box, please report them to uh, GitHub but please also try to give a sane report of this. We have had screenshots sent to us. And yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a reason sometimes it's better to develop outside of law. <laughs> if you have questions about it to us, uh, there's a a uh, list at secondquarter.com where you can reach the people that are familiar with BDR. But if you have other questions, you can just send an email to general and hopefully someone will pick up there and it will be archived and other people can chime in and it will help other people to see what you're doing and not doing. We already had people helping other people. So, so that's good. Yeah. If you want to help, you can read the docs and tell us whether you understand. Most of us are so neck deep in this that they really don't understand the problem anymore. It's obvious. Um, using it would be nice too. Um, reporting problems and so on. It's also another thing is to please help reviewing patches. I think we're, <laughs> why are you grinning? <laughs> um, this is lots and lots of work. Um, several people here in the room have helped this and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I think we all need more review and you don't really don't need to be the most biggest Postgres expert to help here. Uh, every, pretty much everyone can start doing review and you learn quite a bit of Postgres and the knowledge you have will help you at some point in your daily operating life. It's not something that is only applicable to development. The knowledge there helps in all aspects of Postgres. It's also quite possible to add features yourself. It's Postgres licensed, so it's open source. We'll try to integrate it if it's good. If it's not, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so any questions? Um, 
I have, we ha I have on my laptop and my workstation, I have tested, that's what we have on the website, 48 nodes. And, at that, and since then, I've tested something with 60 something. At that point, you start getting into problems because you have a lot of, lot of processes running. <laughs> Um, I think I was had to lim configure my machine because I, it's like 10,000 processes at that point if you do something with it. Um, you would probably should test that with more machines than just one workstation. A similar question is um, in terms of uh, the latency, like what's the highest latency that you've tested? Um, there's actually an option in the configuration file where it artificially introduced latency. Um, we can say BR dot apply delay equals whatever, I think. And then it will just delay uh, com uh, committing, which is very useful during development. Um, I think we tested with a couple seconds there. I don't know the exact number. Yes, I have. Um, I'm not, uh, I think there's a good argument to be made to say we are going to con trying to continue using fun functions. I think it would not be the worst idea. I think some other people are not so much on board with that. I think we're definitely not wanting to have it in a BDR schema, but yeah. Um, on the other hand, it's not very, it would not be absurd to try to reuse the create server and similar command and then subscribe to server because we have this nice infrastructure for the foreign data wrappers. My problem with that is that it gets slightly murkier if you want are multi doing multi-master because you, if, you have, you, if you want to build the mesh connections, then you get, create servers dynamically on all the other nodes. And I'm not sure. I think there's very different strategies. I know, that's one of the reasons why it would be a good idea to say we reuse some, at least the table, I don't know how the table's called right now, um, to have the common knowledge which, what is replicated where. Um, that might not require using the same syntax to create them because there's no need for that necessarily, except especially for the multi-master case where it's probably most useful to have the, the ability to query all the other nodes. I think there's a lot of discussions we can have. I think I want to get these pet dependent patches in, and I think at that point we need to have so, some long emails. Yes, vigorous discussions. <laughs> vigorous agreements. <laughs> yeah, anything else? It, it, it definitely is possible. So the logical decoding in combination with that uh, replication identifier and progress tracking has all the information to make that possible. Where I'm not really, I don't have really many doubts about how to implement the technical part. What I find very complicated is about how to figure out how to configure this. How to make sure that you don't have nodes that can't see any, some changes. That will get, is non trivial and that's the part, so the user interface of this is what worries me. And where I have not yet found something that, oh yeah, this is obviously right. So, but it's not that hard from the technical point of view. You can basically do it right now if you want uh, by just not using the interface functions and saying, I manipulate the internal configuration directly. You can build these kind of setups already. It's just not something I would suggest doing. You'll definitely get to keep the pieces. <laughs> Have you thought about as I know you will, but um, at some point I think we're gonna have to address the big catalog problem. Uh, yeah, I think we. I think. 
It depends on which shared object you talk about, actually. I think we're not going to want to do stuff like query table states replicating. I think that's pretty boring. And it doesn't really make sense because it assumes all the systems are the same. And I think the biggest problem is probably users from a practical point of view. Because to create database, why would you want to replicate it? Around databases, one thing that is pretty interesting is to replicate all the database sets so and so. Because that is actually something that's pretty clearly what you know, understandable what you mean. And we could just say we refuse all the database set when BDR is configured from any database but the one you have configured it from. Or that would not be the worst rule out there. But yeah, roles um, are pretty much harder. Um, I have not yet figured out a good way to do that. I think the capturing the command is not that hard. We just would have a shared queue for those. Okay. Yeah. But what if you want to replicate from different systems and merge, and then it gets very murky. The other option would be to say we introduce database local roles. I'm not a big fan of that, but yeah. But I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't solve the problem today.